Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for March 24th, 2023. Well, we've come to the end of another week. This is Friday. I'll be taking some of your questions. Remember, you can always ask me questions. If I don't get to them on Friday, you can continue to send them to me and I can take them up during the week. But I want to begin by discussing what, what happened this week because we had an amazing contrast between the paradigm of the unipolar order, which is collapsing, and on the other side, the emergence of a new paradigm based on multilateral negotiations, moves toward economic development, and hopefully a new strategic architecture, which does recognize the legitimate needs and interests of other nations. That is, it's based on every nation recognizing that other nations have sovereign rights and those rights have to be defended. So let's begin with the chaos in the West as the unipolar order is collapsing. We have panic in the banking sector. We have complete rejection from leading powers, the US and the British in particular, but also Ukraine, of even considering negotiations. The Ukrainians say they may take the Chinese offer up. Well, we'll see. But uh, Kirby of the uh, National Security Council said, absolutely not. It's not, it's, it's not serious. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But at the same time, we're seeing growing demonstrations in, against transatlantic governments. Millions in the streets in France, uh, strikes in the United Kingdom. And then probably most unsettling of all is the immature chortling coming from Western spokesmen over a meaningless indictment from a, the International Criminal Court against Putin. Just a couple of notes on that. Uh, first, the Ukrainian presidential advisor, Mikhailo Podolyak, who's one of the leading figures in uh, information warfare for Ukraine, uh, who, who clearly is in a world of delusion, he said the warrants are, quote, the beginning of the end for the Russian Federation in its current form on the world stage, unquote. This plays into the whole scenario that essentially leading elements of Western governments have as their intent to use the Ukraine war to break apart Russia and bring about regime change. So we see that coming from a top advisor to President Zelensky. Now, one other note on the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, I found an article in the BBC in April 2019, which said that the ICC rejected a request to investigate war crimes in Afghanistan, citing instability in the country and a lack of cooperation. So they did have brought before them claims of war crimes by the US and the NATO allies in Iraq, but refuse to investigate. Now, on the other side, for much of the rest of the world, we have moves toward a new paradigm, a new strategic and development architecture. The most significant was the Putin G summit, where they reaffirmed the strategic partnership, which is now active as a diplomatic force and as a financial economic force throughout the world. On the diplomatic side, we saw previously the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which was negotiated by China. And now we see moves going ahead for economic investment, development, and further cooperation between those two countries, including King Salman inviting President Raisi from Iran to come to Riyadh for further talks. But there were two more announcements in the last 48 hours that are quite significant. First, Armenia and Azerbaijan, which have been in a protracted conflict, which has been stirred up consistently by Western think tanks and, and Western NGOs and intervention, they announced the moves toward a peace treaty, which has been brokered by Russia. This is very important because there's uh, part of the long-term strategy against Russia is destabilizing the country and breaking it apart. Then also Saudi Arabia and Syria are entering into negotiations. Again, this was part of the, the uh, geopolitical doctrine of using religious differences, political differences, to keep nations at each other's throat. So if you now have Iran and Saudi Arabia talking, Syria and Saudi Arabia, Turkey's involved, Egypt is involved, it's a move to break fully 
from the crisis scenario that was developed by people like Sir Bernard Lewis and Zbigniew Brzezinski, Samuel Huntington. It's a new era, and it's out of the control of the unipolar order. Now, just one other example of leaders of the global south finding their voice. This is particularly interesting from uh, Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, uh, responding to criticism from the State Department about human rights issues in Mexico. He called U.S. officials at a press conference, he called them liars who believe they are the government of the world. Then he raised some concerns about the U.S. when it comes to human rights. In particular, he asked, what about U.S. Uh, persecution of Julian Assange? What does this say about U.S. commitment to press freedom? Very valid point. And then he asked about the rejection of Hirsch's report, Seymour Hirsch's report on U.S. sabotage of Nord Stream. He said, Hirsch shows that the U.S. is engaged in violent actions. What about that? So good indication that the Global South is no longer going to be uh, submitting to this order, this so-called rules-based order of Blinken and, and the Western powers, the imperial powers. So let's get to your questions. The first one, uh, what is going on in France? Does this have a likelihood of changing the government in France? Does it have an implication for the so-called unity of the European Union? Well, the answer is we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we know what's going on. There's a lot of reasons to be opposed to the government of Emmanuel Macron, a former banker, someone who seems to be reasonable at times, but nevertheless has walked a straight line on Ukraine, backing the U.S. and the British position. He's going to be welcoming King Charles there in a few days, and, and this is already causing great anger in, in France. Uh, what are they going to have, a new Entente Cordiale? Is that his idea? Well, what, what really is going on is the economic crisis throughout the Eurozone, combined with the opposition to a war with Russia in Ukraine. Millions of people in the streets. The pension reform is the trigger because it was an attempt to squeeze a little bit of austerity by raising the retirement age by two years. But what it reflects is a lack of consideration by the Macron government for the conditions facing most people in France who are worse off today than they were 10 years ago because of the EU policy. But it also shows his lack of commitment to the institutions of France. He overrode the assembly, which would have probably voted against his reform. He said, we're not even going to consider it. I decree it. And it, it's this little Napoleon mentality which is part of the cause of the uprising, which is now sweeping the whole of France. They, the police said one million in the streets yesterday. The organizers of the demonstration said there may have been two or three million once again in the streets of Paris, and it shows no sign of letting up. You know, add to that strikes in the United Kingdom where people are in terrible shape economically, no pay raises for years, the collapse of the uh, standard of living, the collapse of the healthcare system, collapse of police and fire protection. And then there was a strike at the, at the port of Hamburg yesterday, the biggest port in Germany. So the agitation is going to grow. The question is, will there be a strategy for pulling these various concerns together? For example, also the farmers in Holland, big demonstration because the EU is cutting the cultivation of farmland by 30% in that country, which is one of the breadbaskets for export of food around the world. So the anger against the European Union unelected bureaucrats and the NATO militarists is coming to a head. I think it's going to continue to grow. The question is to have a program, a program for all of Europe, but for each nation to choose a program on credit policy, banking policy, and strategic policy, because most of these countries have been hurt by the loss of cheap Russian oil and gas, and they also wish to do trade with China, which is under attack now in the European Union. So we're seeing a, a something much bigger than appears in the media. 
and it's a fundamental crisis for all of Europe. And as you can be sure, the LaRouche organization with our forces is in, is in the middle of this, putting forward solutions going back to LaRouche's four economic laws. Uh, the next question, uh, which is related, is how significant is the Credit Suisse crisis? Uh, well, it's enormously significant. The Swiss banking has been one of the rocks of stability of Europe for almost two centuries. And the two leading banks are Union Bank of Switzerland and Credit Suisse. They're now one bank. It's now a monster bank. No one's sure how bad the assets are of Credit Suisse, which are now taken over by Union Bank of Switzerland. Initially, the government the Swiss National Bank, rather, was going to bail out Credit Suisse with 54 billion euros. Then they took a better look at the books and they came up with a price tag of over 250 billion for the merger between Union Bank of Switzerland and Credit Suisse. That is, if UBS is going to take over Credit Suisse with all its bad assets, they need access to as much as 250 billion euros. Now, the bigger implication here is that central banks around the world are following the lead of the U.S. Federal Reserve, which committed itself to almost unlimited dollar swaps to banks in the, the Central Bank of Japan, United Kingdom, European Central Bank, uh, a couple of others, I think, uh, Banque de France. Why? Because they know that the whole system is filled with unsustainable debt, uncollectible debt, and questionable assets at the base of their, their books. So we're looking at a new crisis bigger than 2008, bigger than 2019, and one which Lyndon LaRouche had repeatedly warned was coming because of the commitment to shut down physical economy and instead move toward a money-based system controlled by central banks. This is going to continue to be a fight, regardless of what happens in Ukraine. This will continue to be a fight because the Ukraine war itself is largely triggered by the unwillingness of countries such as Russia and China to submit to this funny money banking system of the Western central banks. And now we're seeing nations throughout the global south rebelling against it because they are essentially in insisting that they have a sovereign right to economic development. And if the West won't do it, if the International Monetary Fund won't do it, then they'll look to alternatives. And that's why we see discussions going on of moves toward transaction and investment in regional and national currencies as opposed to the dollar. So I, I would urge people, I got a, a question from uh, RJ. How, do you, how did LaRouche look at this? How did he know what was happening? Was this mathematical, his method? And there's a book over my shoulder called So You Wish to Learn About Economics. And in it, LaRouche discusses what he learned from Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and the scientific principle of dynamics and the interrelationship of human creativity, physical economy, and the increase in productive wealth for a society. That's a starting point. I, I can't give a whole lecture on that in, in today's update. But that's the place to start if you want to get a sense of what Lyndon LaRouche knew and how he knew it. Now, the final question is uh, on a lot of people's minds. Is there anyone refuting the fake stories on the Nord Stream pipelines put out by the New York Times and Die Zeit, which claims that it was a group of six people, including Russians and Ukrainians with fake passports, who rented a yacht from the port of Rostock, went out into the ocean and, and two divers went down and planted the explosives. Well, there, there has been blowback on this. First of all, no one believes it. Even the intelligence agencies that put it out probably are, are now either embarrassed by the rate at which it's unraveling. Uh, but what, there, there were stories in the German press poking holes through it pointing out the weight of the explosives themselves would have been too much for the yacht. Add to that the diving equipment, the compression or decompression chamber, the oxygen and, and other, uh, what, what else is needed to do that kind of deep sea diving. And it's preposterous. Now, interestingly, the gray zone, Aaron Maté and Max Blumenthal, 
raised probably a more relevant question. Why did they come up with such a bad cover story? Is this all they have? And I think that gets to the point of things. This system is collapsing. The political leadership is discredited. They have no solutions. And it's time now for an, a new international mobilization to take power out of the hands of these corporate cartels that are crashing the economy, uh, causing wars all over the globe, uh, hunger crises, food shortages, sanctions. This is a world which has to move into a new paradigm. That's the fight of the Schiller Institute. That's what Helga Zepp-LaRouche is spearheading in the carrying out the legacy of her husband, Lyndon LaRouche. And it's something all of you can join. Now, tomorrow, Saturday, for the Manhattan Project, which you can find at the LaRouche Organization website, a link to it, at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have an extensive discussion of the relationship between physical economy, scientific discovery, and human creativity in the tradition of Lyndon LaRouche's Strategic Defense Initiative. So I'd urge you all to join us and do some serious thinking. And part of what you should be thinking about is joining our movement to create a change. So thanks for joining me this week. I'll be back next week. Hello, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our videos. Support our independence to produce videos like these. Become a member of the LaRouche Organization at thelarouche.org slash member. By becoming a member for $25 or more, you'll get special access to the EIR Alert Daily Briefing and Weekly Magazine, which is what I read to stay on top of things.